Welcome back to the show, everybody. This has been a really wonderful start to this episode because I have the one and only Ginger Lynn flirting absolutely <laughs> shamelessly with my poor sound engineer, Ernie. We haven't even started yet. I love Ernie. I can see that. I love Ernie. When I walked in, the first thing I, I, I when I saw him, I just wanted to wrap my arms around and him. And you did. And I and I did. I did. But you I asked did. first, which was nice. Yeah. No, I'm not the, I, I don't just do it. Like, I would love to touch your titties, but I wouldn't just do it. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate yeah, that. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a lot of girls, like, come on to you when you're on the show? Um... No, I don't think, I don't know. And if they do, I don't really realize it. I've actually had people leave comments on my YouTube channel saying like, blah, blah, blah. Like, Holly, didn't you see you're coming on to you? So and I, I like didn't. You just see missed it. it. So if I were to say to you, Holly, I would love to lick your pussy. Would you get it? Well, yeah, I, I feel like you're being pretty direct when you say that. I feel like I could I could understand that. Holly, if you're down, I am right there with you. <laughs> what would my mother say, Ginger? I know. That's the only thing. It, there's a creepy factor because it's like I've known you since forever. Yeah. Since you were a little girl. And, and you've probably hooked up with my mom, right? No. No? I have never hooked up Are with Are you like mom. the only person that my mom didn't sleep with? They, she never came on to me. But huh. Probably because at all of her parties by the time... I walked through the door, I was already on everybody. Mm. You know, I was just, I'm a wild child and yeah. I love sex. Yeah. And I love open, free environments where I can go in and just be myself. Yeah. And it's not that my whole pie is is a big sex pie. Mm-hmm. You know, my pie has got, you know, my, my art, my pie has got being a mother, my art. Yeah, is art or, or cooking. And, well, you're you know. you're more than just somebody who enjoys sex. That exactly. can be a big part of your personality. It doesn't mean it's everything. No, but the part that what I guess I'm trying to say is that everybody has that part. Mm-hmm. But what they tend to do is not explore it and not bring it out and not mm. try it. And everybody wants to make a porno with their with their lover. Everybody mm. wants to have a three way. I mean, I shouldn't say everybody, but there's there's a lot of people that have a lot of fantasies that. They should share with each other. And Why do you think people don't? I don't know. I, I think because people um, are afraid of being judged, mm. afraid of being criticized. The stigma. Uh, is my kink too fucked up for you? Can I swear in here? Yeah. Okay. Is my kink too, you know, too fucked up for you? And, and so what I've done, and it's been, it's worked hugely su- successfully for me, is when I hook up with you, like before we fuck, this is what I like. This is what I want. This is how I am. This is who I am. You know, and, and, and we just kind of set the ground rules and go in. I've been in a relationship now. I don't even believe this, but it's coming up on 11 years with the same man. Wow. With the same man. And, uh, I just lost my train of thought. So you were talking about sex and, Enjoying oh, it, so exploring it, him, communicating. Yes, when I met him, I, I told him right away, you know, I, I'm, I've got some, you know, sick, twisted, kinky things that mm-hmm. I really enjoy. And uh, so he, we shared our sick and twisted kinkies the first night that we were together. Mm-hmm. And and there's never been a problem. There's no like, God, I really want to do that, but I can't tell him because we've been together so long or what will he say? Right. You know, I think it's important to get it out as soon as possible and just lay it on the line and don't keep the secrets. All you're doing is it because you're still masturbating to your secrets, mm-hmm. you know, and, and everybody has them. Mm-hmm. Everybody. Yeah. And a lot of them are really fucked up. Yeah. But they're fantasies. You yeah. can fantasize about anything mm-hmm. and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Reality on, on a lot of your fantasies were, are is very wrong, very yeah. inappropriate. But right. in your head, yeah, yeah, I think it's a good thing. What um, what were some of like the crazy kinky things that you were maybe afraid to tell them? Um, I'm into water sports. Okay, I like pee pee. Okay, um, one of the things that that I really enjoy. And it's going to sound like I'm so messed up in the head, but I've only had one guy, the guy that I'm with, be able mm-hmm. to do this. And I had him fuck me in the ass and then stop, let his dick go soft enough that he could piss in my ass mm-hmm. and then fuck me with the piss as lube. Oh, wow. How, so, how was that? Fucking great and awesome, <laughs> except at the end. So we're at his place and uh, you know I've still got you know, his piss in my ass. Mm-hmm. It didn't all fuck out. So I'm, I go into the bathroom and I'm in the bathtub. I'm just thinking, well, I'll just, you know, shoot out the, the, yeah. Clean bath, yourself out. Clean myself out in the bathtub. Well, we have not at this point, we're maybe two weeks into dating. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like I said, I put it on the line right away. Mm-hmm. 
And so I'm squirting the, the, the pee-pee out of my butthole, and this tiny little turd comes out. <laughs> And and Nick, my boyfriend, walks in. And I'm like, "Don't come in here! You can't come in here!" And it's like, and so I've got my toe, and I'm trying to get it to go down. The, it's it's the size of a pea, and I'm trying to get it to go down the drain. And he's coming over because he wants to watch because he thinks it's sexy. And and I'm like, trying to hide turd, this turd. turd down the tub. <laughs> Did he catch on, or were you able to hide it? He, I, he did not catch on, but I cannot keep a secret. And at the time, I was doing my Sirius XM radio show, right? And so he found out about it on the air the next day, <laughs> <laughs> listening to the show. And, oh and my he actually gosh. called in. He's like, you pooped in my tub. I said, no, <laughs> it was a tiny little turd. Didn't, that's not a poo. Was that ever an issue for you guys? Like you being, I mean, you're obviously a very open person yes. and you're very honest. Did that, was that ever an issue with the two of you? Or was it something that he just accepted from the beginning? As far as men go, I'll have to put make a general statement here first. I have found in my experience that the type of man who is attracted to a porn star either has a huge porn addiction um, or they're the knight in shining armor that want to save you. And mm. there's not a whole lot of in between. Right. In the beginning, when you meet me, it's Ginger Lynn. It's fun. It's exciting. Everything's right. cool. There's no problem. Right. You know, you start to like me and issues come up mm. and it takes a really, really strong, secure man to be able to to deal with being my man, yeah. knowing that anybody that has a computer can just go online and watch me fuck mm-hmm. and suck and do other people. And somehow he's he's very he's a CPA. Mm-hmm. You know, he's he's an accountant. I, I finally stopped with the bad boys, went with a good normal one. Mm-hmm. And his kinks I found out by communication are are very similar to mine. Mm. And so his acceptance, although it was difficult because I have a public persona, it was there. And this is the first man that I've ever met that is neither trying to, you know, save me or, you know, is like, I'm Ginger Lynn. Yeah. You know, he He loves you for who you are. Yeah. He he liked, he met Ginger Lynn and two weeks later was in love with Ginger Lynn Allen. Right. Yeah. That's got to be... Did you ever find, think that you were going to find something like that? Because I know a lot of girls in the industry that, you know, struggle so hard with dating because of exactly what you just said. And did you, did you feel did. like you would ever find that kind of relationship? And and if so, do you think that there was something in particular that maybe you got right within your own world that allowed someone like him to come into your world? Do you know what I'm saying? Say that again. Like, was there any, you know how they say that sometimes the right person doesn't come along oh, until did I, you're okay, okay, until ready you're open and ready for it. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't have the, the issues about dating when I was in porn, when I was younger or uh, even up until I met my man, you know, 10 years ago, right? because I, I fuck people. Mm-hmm. And so it, it, I didn't really worry about dating. It mm-hmm. meant nothing. It was no big deal. And I had, it did get me in trouble though, because I, I started a rule that if we were dating and we got into a little bit of time there, if we got to the six month point, that's when I would make a decision. Either you're worth it and let's take this to the next step or we're done and I don't want to waste your time or mine. Right. I thought it was a brilliant idea problem backlash is that six months to the day I had five of the fuckers get down to their knee and propose and so it's hard to say no yeah so I said yes nine times I've been engaged nine times wow I've never walked down the aisle I wear my man's ring now Mm -hmm. but I'm not married and I don't want to be I I don't want a piece of paper that the government you know sanctifies or whatever the fuck they do that I'm, I'm, I'm married for me personally. And I think marriage is fabulous. I think Mm -hmm. it's wonderful for most people. For me personally, I think that if I were to get married, I would feel that I was owned by somebody and it would just, it would ruin it for me. I'm too much of a free spirit. And even when I say that I may be a free spirit, but I'm a, I'm a, a faithful free spirit, right? except for girls. Well, you can, yeah, and also too, you can be emotionally connected to one particular person, but physically active with other people. That doesn't mean that you- Oh, no, no. You know. Well, only with women, you know, that that's mm-hmm. all that I do. But did I, I didn't think I would ever find that person. Mm-hmm. And I kind of resigned myself to, it was okay because I, 
I like me Mm -hmm. and I have a lot of friends and I, I can keep myself very busy. I don't rely on a partner to make me whole. Right. Um, Is that something that took you a while to like get to that point where you felt that way? Or have you always felt that way? I've always been a heartbreaker. I've always been a, you know, love them and leave them. You Mm -hmm. know, when I'm done with you, I'm done with you. And it sounds harsh and it sounds cold and I don't mean to be that way. But uh, I've been, I've, I've never been dumped Mm -hmm. ever. Um, I've had a bad breakup, a really fucking bad breakup that, Took three years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was fun in between. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I you know what? I and I keep my head on pretty straight. Mm-hmm. I only did porn when I wanted to do porn. Mm-hmm. The day that I woke up and I thought to, usually I would wake up and go, Yes, I'm gonna be eating this pussy today. I'm gonna be sucking that cock today. It's gonna be the best day ever. And I woke up one day and I went, fuck. I do not want that dick in my mouth. And I was under contract with Vivid. I had two films left to perform in. And and I, I went into the office and talked to uh, Stephen Hirsch, the owner of Vivid, and said to him, you know, I, I'm, I can't do this anymore. It's, my head is not in the game. And I made myself a, a promise that as soon as my head wasn't right, because it'll fuck you up, mm-hmm. I'm out. And he was really cool about it. He said, you know what? You don't have to honor the last two films. I'm a woman of my word, so I did do those last two films. Um, so, yeah. But So let's back up a little bit. Um, right. How did you get into porn? How did this whole journey start for you? Pretty much the way that it did for most girls back in the 80s. Um, I was a troubleshooter for a company called Musicland, and I had nine stores that I had to constantly keep in the black and out of the red and, you know, a lot of work, and I'm working – 70 hours a week. I'm making two grand a month. I live in a shit apartment and I'm just, you know, I, I, I'm not enjoying California because mm-hmm. I'm just working all the time and I have no money. So I answered an ad in the Orange County Register. Uh, I think it was the Reg- Orange County, whatever the Orange County paper was. And the ad read, figure models wanted 500 to $5,000 per day. And I'm five foot fun, which is pretty much five foot five foot. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, I used to be, I, I used to say five, three, but, but you know what? The doctor keeps telling me I'm like just a little over five foot. So, uh, <laughs> now I, I keep doing that because I've got a million thoughts that we're, I'm answering. So bat, we're backing up to, yes, you answered an ad in the orange County I register. I answered an ad in the orange County register and I drove up not feeling like I was, you know, supermodel at, mm-hmm. at my height, but I knew that I had a good body and I was proportionate and I was comfortable with my body. Mm-hmm. I had no trouble with nudity whatsoever. Mm-hmm. I've always been open sexually, always been, I've just been open always. You know, mm-hmm. I, I say it like I feel it, like I, like, like it is to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went into Jim South's office and there was a photographer in there by the name of Stephen Hicks. Mm-hmm. And Stephen said, I want to shoot you for Penthouse. I'm going to do uh, Mexico for two weeks. I'll shoot you when I get back. And I'm like, yay, that's the $5,000 gig. Yay, yay, yay. <laughs> so, I, but I still say he leaves. And, and yeah. back in those days, you kind of hung out in your agent's office because people would come in. They took Polaroid. You yeah. looked at the books of all the people in the wicker chair. from. The- yeah. So quickly, I just want to tell people who Jim South is because I'm actually interviewing him next week. Oh, he's wonderful. Yeah, I I'm Jim. so excited. So Jim South was the... OG porn agent. There's a bunch of porn agencies now, but back in the day, there was like, I think one other two. guy. Yeah, there was who Jim was like, and Reb. Right, right. He was like, not, Jim was the guy, like world modeling. And he, and because back then digital didn't exist, he took Polaroids of models. So if you wanted to see a new girl, you had to go into his office and he had books filled with Polaroids that you'd have to flip through and look exactly. at the new girls. So that's where Ginger was. So back to your story. So I'm, I'm in there and I see the girls on the wall <clears> and I'm like, Fuck! I want to be a wall girl. Yeah, you know, there's Shauna Grant up there, and Seika's up there, and and I don't even know that they're porn stars. I mm-hmm. at this point in my head, they're just models, and I'm like, I want to be up there on the wall. Yeah. So uh, I stay in Jim's office for a few hours, and um, another photographer comes in by the name of Suze Randall. Who could that be? I don't. I've never heard that name before. Uh, she's <laughs> fabulous. I love her. So Suze comes in and she says, I want to shoot you for Penthouse. And I said, I can't. I already agreed to shoot 
for Stephen to hit. And I could just imagine my and, mom's reaction because she's so competitive. She was just like, no, no, dar- no, darling, you're shooting for me. We're shooting tomorrow. We're shooting in two days or whatever it was. The best thing that any model can do to get her, my mom to shoot them is to say, number one, I ride horses, or number two, I'm shooting for Earl Miller or Stephen Hicks next week, <laughs> and you are booked like that. I mean, legit. It worked every time. It was quite funny. Oh, and she was just so <laughs> wonderful. It was just, there was a comfortable, comfortability, is that a word? It was just, it was just your your mom's a woman. I'm a woman, and she made me feel beautiful. She made me feel special. She made me feel uh, just just like a model, like mm-hmm. like a pretty girl. And yeah. so, I the first shoot that I ever did was with your mother. Oh wow! And it was shot as a centerfold for Penthouse. Mm-hmm. And what happened is three months later, we'll fast forward. Jim has been constantly asking me to do commercial, which means to do sex on camera, and I am way against. Is that what he called it? Uh, commercial. Really? He it commercial. Yeah. Uh huh. Com- you do commercial work, commercial sex scenes. It was, ah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I like the lingo. I hadn't heard that before. Oh, I, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, that was what it was called. And okay. I had this stereotype image, which is fucked up, but I did. I I thought that the girls in in the industry were drug addicts. They were hookers. They were low lifes. They were just people who couldn't do anything else except fuck for money. Right. And. I can do a lot of things. I don't have to fuck for money. And I, right. and so I had this image until I met a, a, a woman in his office. Uh, I always forget her name. She has red hair. Anyway, she was beautiful, articulate, intelligent, reading a script out loud, took her to lunch, drilled her. She gave me the rules. I went back into Jim's office and I said, okay, I'll do porn, but... I want cast approval. (laughs) I want script approval. (laughs) I want $1,000 per scene. And I want to be. Which I assume was a lot back then. Oh, that was what the stars got. Yeah. Yeah, That was that. That's what Jacqueline Lorian's. That was who the girl was. Um, So script approval, cast approval, $1,000 per scene for just a basic boy, girl or girl, girl. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, up to like five grand for anal. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I just had my different, my different things. And uh, I'm so sorry. I keep losing my train of thought today. That's okay. So you told Jim that you wanted all of these things. Oh, so I told Jim that I wanted all of these things and he's on the floor hysterically laughing. He's like, you are never going to get that. That She's a, she's a, a porn star. Yeah. No one is going to bank on you and, and, and give you what you're asking for. And I said, that's okay. Then I won't do it. And I was fine with that. I, I still have my, my day or day line, day runners from back in the day. Mm-hmm. I've kept a calendar for every year since 1983. Wow. So I, I worked like 28 days out of each month for wow. the first three months. Wow. Just doing magazine work. Just doing magazine work. Yeah. Back then you could do that. Yeah. It's so crazy. It's com- impossible to do that now. That's that's all I did. Yeah. And, and I could have continued to do that. They, you know, there were, I, and I did for years. Mm-hmm. Uh, but a couple of weeks after I told Jim I would do it and he laughed at me and I said, that's okay. <laughs> um there was a woman and her husband. Do you remember? You, you wouldn't remember. There used to be a show called The Gong Show. Mm-hmm. And there was a man, Chuck Barris, that ran it. And there was this, he would have people come on, contestants that would do silly things. And if they were really bad, this big, tall, beautiful, lanky blonde would hit a gong and you'd be gonged off the show. Mm-hmm. Well, this woman is Svetlana Marsh. Her husband is David Marsh. They have a quarter of a million dollar budget. They want to make their first film. They want to shoot two films on the island of Kauai with only girls that have never been seen on film before. Oh, wow. They agree to all my terms. Wow. And I'm going, fuck, this is awesome. And you're going to this Hawaii. Is, and, and I'm going to Hawaii. Then... I got scared. Like I, I got really excited, and then I went home and went, "Oh my god, I've never fucked on film. I've never said a line of dialogue. I've never done any of this. How am I gonna? How do I? I, I, I can't. I don't think I can do this." Right. And so I called up Jim, and he goes, "Jim was always calling you, darling." He said, "You know, don't worry about it." <laughs> so he set me up a, a practice day, and this was such a practice day. We shot at eight millimeter. 
Oh, wow. So it was Michael Carpenter. And uh, I had two scenes that day, back to back. It was in a, a place in Santa Monica. My first male performer I worked with was was uh, Tom Byron. Okay. And I loved Tommy. He was a skinny little wonderful guy with a big dick, nice personality, not the brightest bulb in the world, but I, 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 I loved fucking him. Yeah. Loved to fuck him. Um, and so – That started off, I'm like, okay, I can totally do this. I'm going to be fine. Then the second person walks in, and it's Ron Jeremy. And I'm like, he's like as old as my dad, and he's hairy, (laughs) and he smells, and he's fat. And this is in his skinny days. I was going to say, wait a minute. Was this Ron, like, before he became the hedgehog? There was never a skinny Ron. There was never a good Ron. There was never a good Ron, ever. Okay. Ever. So Fair enough. I go to Michael and I'm like, I don't think I can do this if I have to look at him. So I said, can we do the entire scene doggy style? <laughs> and I remember, <laughs> and, and I remember I'm not, this is my first day of filming. So I, I, Michael agrees and we're, we're, and we're in doggy style and Michael's going, all right, lick your lips. Now, I don't know what that means. So I'm going... <laughs> I got red lipstick now. Now I look like a clown. I've got this big fat hairy guy behind me fucking me. But here's the thing. It felt good. Uh-huh. I didn't look at him, but I loved his dick. So I thought to myself, if I can fuck Ron Jeremy, I can do anything. I am right for this business. I don't want to ever do it again. Wow. But if I, so that was my practice run and it was successful. Uh, <laughs> oh, poor Ron. <laughs> oh, don't feel sorry for him. He's a pig. I, you know, that's, we'll get to it, but that was actually another question uh, somebody had for you was about Ron. But anyways, okay. So, so you do this practice run. So I do the practice run. Um, everything goes great. And in December, December 9th, 1983, I fly to the island of Kauai. We've got all of the cast and crew. We, the plane is full of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's like 50 people that they brought over. They've mm-hmm. got, you know, like a full on cast and crew and, you know, they <laughs> flew everyone over. Yeah. And some of us sat in first class. I mean, wow. this was like a big deal. And so we got to the island of Kauai and I did, my first scene was a sex scene. That was the first thing I ever had to do. And it was with Jerry Butler and I'm, I had approved him and he was gorgeous and I'm like, okay, yeah, let's do this. So I have a sex scene with Jerry. It's amazing. I'm thinking this is wonderful. And then after that, I had one line of dialogue. And what's supposed to happen now is we're shooting part of the other movie. Mm -hmm. And so I've got these little dolphin shorts on and one of those gray sweatshirts that's all cut up, Mm -hmm. totally 80s. Yeah. Got the headband, the the leg warmers, and I'm running along this bike path. And um, what's supposed to happen is a guy comes up on a motorcycle and starts hitting on me and Mm -hmm. I'm trying to avoid him. Right. And what I'm supposed to say is leave me alone. Mm Mm-hmm. So I'm going, I'm running along, and they've got the boom guy running along with me. And every time I go to say my line of dialogue, I start to laugh. I cannot do the dialogue. It's impossible for me. I just, they had to shut filming down for the day. I could not say one sentence. Wow. Now I'm going, fuck, I've got shit tons of dialogue. What am I going to do? Mm-hmm. And so Jerry uh, is, is, a, is a trained actor, mm-hmm. and we hit it off right away. And so I said to Paul... Jerry, same person. Um, you know, I, I need some help. I, I, I don't know how to do this. And I know that you're an actor. Will you help me? And he said, sure. So I went over and I brought my script. And, and, and when I, I got there, he took my script and he just threw it, took it away from me and just started talking to me. And he was saying, so tell me about your family and where you're from and who you are and who's your favorite person in the world. And at the time, my grandfather had just passed on. And so I was telling him about this and, and, all of a sudden, he goes, yeah, you know, your grandfather's a piece of shit. And, he, and every person that I talked about that I loved and that was going on, he just started calling me names. He threw me down on the bed, was holding me down, telling me what a piece of shit I was. And I got, and I'm like, fuck you. And he got up laughing hysterically, threw my script at me and said, now let's run our dialogue. Wow. And we did. And I never had difficulties with dialogue again. Wow. Because I was so in my head. Yeah. And he made me so mad that I was out of my head. I didn't give a fuck about the dialogue or yeah. the words. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. wanted to kill him for insulting my grandfather. Right. Great technique. I mean, it wow. made it so. And, and I've watched Surrender in Paradise and a little bit of Hanky Panky. And, you know, I didn't win any awards for it. 
But for my first film and no no training, no acting whatsoever, except for Jerry Butler's little little thing, uh, I was really proud of my work. And the films, we shot them both. They went flawlessly. I turned 21 on the 14th while we were filming there. Uh, I had a romance with Jerry Butler. We actually got engaged. Uh, this is one of the eight people you got engaged to. Nine. Nine, sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's in there, and he's I, he's the only one that I kept the ring because it was just a piece of shit little. Uh, he got it on the island. It, it, it was a, it's adorable. It's a little um, gold plated uh, little hand mm-hmm. with a ruby in it. That Aww. was my engagement ring. Oh, cute! So I kept that. Oh my gosh! So that was my first film experience, and I thought I would only do two movies. So my real name is Ginger Lynn Allen. So mm-hmm. I thought, oh, I'll just use Ginger Lynn. The only people that see movies are the ones that go to the theaters and the movie houses. No one's going to know that I did it. Yeah, this so, is before VHS, before the it internet, was, yeah, before anything. When you thought, when you could maybe do a couple porn movies, and, and nobody it, would know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I became too well-known too quickly, and mm. my family found out very quickly. Mm. And uh, your mom actually saved my life, literally. Mm. I had, Do you want to hear the story? I do, but you know what we have to do first? We have to take a commercial break. Let's do it. And then let's uh, we'll come back and we'll hear how my mom saved Ginger's life. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q&As where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. Okay, so we're back. So, Ginger, please tell me how my mother, Suze Randall, saved your life. She she really honestly did save it. What happened was my uh, father was back in Rockford, Illinois, and went into uh, an adult bookstore, got the little token, went in, and there I was being fucked doggy style by Ron Jeremy. Oh, no. Yeah. That's a terrible way for a father to find out. Are you kidding me? Of all people. I mean, it was just- (laughs) With Ron Jeremy. It was with Ron. So my father tells the guy that owns the store, he wants to buy every copy of this and get him out of there. And the guy says, fuck you, no, I'm not going to do that. And my dad is a cop, or was at the time. And my dad beat the guy up that owned the store. So my dad got arrested, got called my grandmother, got bailed out, took my grandmother down to the dirty bookstore, made her watch. And she's like, that's not Ginger. That's not Ginger. She just refused to believe it was oh me. And the only difference was I'm naturally a redhead. And so I had blonde hair and I was Ginger Lynn instead of Ginger Lynn Allen. And my grandmother still didn't believe it was oh me. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. So... It was it was really horrible. So I, I get a phone call from my answering service saying that there's a family emergency at about six o'clock in the morning one one day, and so I, I call. I'm thinking that you know my grandma's died or something horrible has happened. Right. And my father picks up and he goes, "What the fuck are you doing?" And I'm like, "Holy shit!" Because I told him I posed for Penthouse, but I didn't tell him that I was doing porn, mm-hmm. and it, it was. The worst conversation ever. My family means so much to me, and I'm so close with them. My dad's my best friend. I was disowned. I was told not to come home for Christmas. I have three younger brothers and sisters. I was told I they, I was not allowed to see them. And 
I was just suddenly so alone. Right. And I, I started doing cocaine. I just was doing coke and I was fucking up and I was showing up late to sets and I, I would still be up after, you know, all being all night and show up to a set wired. And was that as prevalent in the eighties as the, as people believe it was? Um, not for me, not on set. It mm-hmm. was on set a lot, but I don't like to fuck on Coke. Uh-huh. I, you know, I, I used to love Coke, but mm-hmm. I wanted to talk. I didn't want to fuck. Mm-hmm. So it was not, it didn't work well for me during mm-hmm. porn. Um, so you. I'm disowned. I'm fucking up. Uh, I'm not getting the work. I'm not looking good. I'm way too skinny. And I live in this, this uh, house up in Topanga Canyon, in this big A-frame house. And your mom shows up at my door. Now, I'm in the middle of nowhere. This is not a place you just show up. You've got to drive up and find the canyons in the back. Mom, and the, my mom's the, good at that. Yeah. She likes so, to make her appearances. Oh, yeah. So your mom just shows up. She comes in. She's got a joint behind her ear. She sits me down and she tells me I'm fucking up. She's like, you've got choices here. You can, you can just go downhill and fuck up and, 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 and lose it. Or you can get your shit together and be the star that you can be. Because right now you're just fucking up. And we smoked the joint and we talked for hours and your mom told me to incorporate. Your mom told me to teach, to treat it like a business. Your mom told me if I'm going to be stupid enough to do drugs, don't do them when I'm working. Your mom stopped me from, after the talk with her, what I did was I bought an eight ball of Coke uh, <laughs> and I sat down and I wrote my father a letter, which I still, he passed away a few years ago and I have the letter back. And basically I said to him, you know what? You raised me with these values. You raised me to believe in myself. You raised me to never say yes to anything I didn't want to do. You raised me to have this set of morals and life skills. And I have those and I love those. And if I worked at 7-Eleven, if I were the president, or if I'm fucking on film, I'm the same girl. And if you choose to disown me and not love me when you told me you don't judge people, then fuck you. I don't want you as my parents anymore. And... Uh, my father called me crying. We both cried. I got my shit together. I stopped doing drugs. Uh, not com- well, for a while. For a while. For, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped doing them recklessly where I was ruining my life. Right. I, I, I was much more of a recreational drug user than right. the daily that I had become. So your right. mom, had she not shown up that day, I, I don't know what would have happened. I, I don't know if I would have written that letter to my parents. I don't know if I would have just totally lost it completely, but it would not have been a good scenario any way that you look at it. And so your mom, she doesn't remember it. And it's one of the most uh, life-changing experiences that I've ever had. Wow. That's and, amazing. Yeah. I love to hear those stories. Yeah. I I love your mom. She's just I one of the too. advice that, today for people, girls that want to get into the business if you don't have your your head on straight, if you're doing it because you want to make a quick buck and you want to do this and you you know you're gonna fuck yourself up in the head. Once you do this, it doesn't go away. It's there forever. And every fucking asshole with a camera now is a porn producer. Right. And and I just they need. I feel like somebody comes needs to come in and just wrap their arms around these new girls and guide them. I mean, I I shot a girl. I have an auction website called GingerlandAuctions.com, and mm-hmm. I the girl. Girls, what happens is when you do a movie or you do a photo shoot, you can only use your lingerie once, maybe twice, right. three times if you push it. So what the girls do is they save up their lingerie. They come over. I photograph them in it, and then their fans can get their lingerie. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so this girl that I'm photographing has been in the business for two weeks and already done two DPs, which is a double penetration. That's a yeah. cock in your pussy, cock in your ass. Two weeks in the business. Uh, it. it, it they just get shot up and and chewed up and spit out. And I wouldn't recommend for anyone to get in the adult industry today. I just wouldn't. Interesting. Um, maybe if you wanted to be a cam girl, that's all, that, that way you've got control. But there's sleazy fucking agents out there. There are girls that I've sent girls home that came over just to model for me, mm-hmm. you know, and gone, I, you shouldn't be doing this, sweetheart, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there aren't enough people that look at the girl and actually see them and know that they're too broken to be in the industry. Right. So I don't think that 
everyone in the industry is here because they had an abusive or a bad childhood mm-hmm. or an upbringing. But I do believe that they are part of a, a special group of people that are usually extremely creative and need more attention mm-hmm. than the normal Joe. Yeah. Or that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Joe or Ginger. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it, it's really interesting because the adult industry is filled with so many different kinds of people. And there's definitely those stories of girls who come in the industry who really don't belong. Um, also, Akira said it on my podcast once, and, and I've always remembered it because I feel like she said it best. She said, the adult industry is not good for most people. Absolutely. But not. for a tiny group of people, it's the perfect job. Uh, so, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. Yes. So it's like you need to recognize if it's the perfect job for you or if it's something that's going to fuck with you emotionally. You know, the stigma is real. Follow you well, for the rest of your life, prevent you from getting other jobs, absolutely. seeking a different life. There's actually a case that just came out the other day. Um, I think the girl's name is Nicole. I can't remember her stage name, but she was in porn for like a little bit, maybe like a year or something like that. Right. She quit. She went and got into nursing. And then she essentially got pushed out of her school because they found out what she did for a living, which was devastating so to her. So wrong. What has that got to do with anything? Right. But this is so common. And it's yeah. just so infuriating because it's like the society tells you, you know, porn is horrible. Don't be in it. Get out of porn. Or you're like, okay, I'm going to get out of porn. Try to make something else of your life. And then they won't even let you then they don't allow continue you. on and make something else of your life. So she's actually suing her school. For discrimination, it's one of the first cases that of that nature where um, somebody's suing for discrimination for having been a sex worker. So it's really interesting to see what kind of precedent this might like to follow. That case that sounds really, really interesting because I, I I don't know what I would do if I had to have a regular job. You know, same. (laughs) I mean, I don't. I did porn for two years and three months. Uh, Was that it? That, yes, that was my initial. Wow. I quit for 13 and made a seven film comeback in 1999. Right. Uh, and I will go out on a limb here and say that I believe that I'm, I was the highest paid porn star ever. I received $50,000 per movie and did seven films for ECA. That's insane. Kicks fucking ass. Yeah. Nobody yeah. makes that kind of money no, now. No. So it, it you know, I, I was just in it at the right time. Right. And everyone who was in it wanted to be there. We were like these 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 rebels without a cause, you know, and we were we loved to fuck. We most of us, a lot I shouldn't say most, a lot of us fucked before we filmed. I always sucked to dick before I got I got in trouble all the time with the makeup artist. <laughs> I just did your lips and you just sucked the cock and did it. I'm going to be sucking in a minute. It's going to come off anyway. No, you need to. (laughs) But I had this apartment with a sunken in living room and we used to call it the pit. Mm -hmm. And so after filming, there would be, you know, whoever wanted to would come over and we would just do blow and fuck for days. Mm -hmm. So I had the pit. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, you definitely have to be somebody that loves sex to be in the industry, you know, to do it. Just for the money, like you said, um, the money will never be enough. It'll never be enough for um, the way that the adult industry will follow you for the rest of your life. But, you know, there's been a lot of women who've made an incredible career out of adult. And the difference is now compared to how it was with you before is that these personal platforms that these girls have, they're now making more money working for themselves and creating their own content than they are working for companies. See, now that I I admire and I, I, I respect that. I just hate to see people get hurt. Yeah. I hate to see that vast majority who should not be in porn mm-hmm. getting into it and the ones that know it and do it right there there's been so many amazing wonderful women in the adult industry. I don't mean to to yeah. say anything against the girls because mm-hmm. there are a million not oh, probably a million now. Right. You know, wonderful girls but I'd say 95% of them are in the wrong business. Hmm. You know, I I was actually, I've been thinking about this recently, and I wonder if the mistake of getting into porn, and I don't know if maybe I'm thinking like too deeply in this, but is less about the act of doing porn than the stigma and the shame society piles on you afterwards. Because I was listening to that interview with Mia Khalifa, 
And she actually didn't seem to talk about how her experience specifically in porn was bad. Like on set, she even talked about how it was very professional and how her coworkers, you know, the guys that she worked with treated her really well. What she seemed to really take issue with was how her life changed afterwards and how people saw her afterwards and Mm -hmm. how much attention she got and how the stigma followed her. Right. So – a part, I guess, maybe this is a little too idealistic, but for me, rather than maybe change the porn itself, and obviously there's a lot of things that need to change, and things are changing. Like agencies are becoming better and more reputable. Those smaller shitty agents, they definitely exist, but they're kind of being pushed out. Social media has given women a voice and where now they can kind of call out bad seeds and they can kind of band right. together and that kind of thing. But like for me, ideally, I would love to see the way the world sees porn change. That would be a beautiful thing. and, and I you think know that what? would just make everyone's lives better. But I think people already do see the beauty in porn and yeah. they do love it because true. it's being consumed by billions and billions and billions of people. Mm-hmm. So they do love it. They do appreciate it. It's just that they themselves are too insecure to admit that this is something they like. So it, it, the people that are doing the shaming – have watched the movies. Yeah. That's, you know, and the shaming part really freaks me out these days. I don't personally initially read any of my emails. Mm-hmm. I don't read my Twitter following or Twitter. I don't read my Instagram. My, my boyfriend does it first and mm-hmm. deletes anything that's going to upset me. Mm-hmm. Cause I can have a thousand people say something nice about me and you and get that one, one asshole yeah. and you're like, yeah, what? I like my baby toe. I thought it was really pretty, you know? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. But, I mean, when it starts to get where girls begin to commit suicide over it, those, again, are the girls that should not have gotten into it in the first place. And shame on all the fuckers who are cowards who would – who through the internet only will will shame people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And the problem is that the internet, you know, has given everybody a soapbox. And it's given everybody the ability to communicate – with their favorite star. And, you know, you shouldn't necessarily have to hear everybody's fucking personal opinion. Exactly. You know, why do you have to, why do you have to absorb everybody else's shame and everybody else's anger? Exactly. And that's what you get when you become a celebrity online. It, it, it's ridiculous. It's, it's very, very difficult. And I'm so lucky that I don't see it because I know they come in. I know that they're there. Mm-hmm. I know that, you know, there's things that are just mean. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm really lucky. I don't see any of it. So, I just, are you like so glad that you were a star in the time before the internet came along and before social media and all this stuff? I am so fucking grateful that I was a star and that I was young before there were cell phones mm. and everybody taping everything because I was I was just a wild child. I remember there was you know I became once I became famous, uh, clubs would would contact me and ask invite me to their club caught me a bottle of champagne and bring me in. Mm-hmm. So I went to this club one night and they caught me a bottle of champagne and I brought five or six of my girlfriends, including Gina Fine. And I'm out there, Gina Fine and I are dancing. We're both wearing skirts. And we both end up eating each other's pussies on the dance floor. Mm-hmm. Okay. We were asked to leave and I refused until I finished my champagne. Um, <laughs> but had there been cell phones, yeah. had there been social media, I did a lot. There are so many things in stripping. You know, I mean, you know that people are taking pictures of you when you're stripping. I I toured for 13 years, and there's always that time where you're doing that stupid underbite when Mm -hmm. you're up, and that's the photo that you get. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's like how the paparazzi looks for the worst photo of whatever celebrity they're going after, and they post that. I have some asshole that continually keeps changing my Wikipedia photos. I, uh, gained, I gained some weight uh, a few years ago, and I've lost it all, but I was a size 12, and uh-huh. now I'm a 4 again. But a 12 was really big for me at 5 yeah. foot tall. And every fucking time I go back on there, I'll have friends change it because they won't let me change it. Mm-hmm. 
And they put the fat pictures back up. I'm like, who is doing this? Why? I don't look like that. It's so unfair. Oh, <laughs> uh, I know. It's it's like... And that bothers me. So yeah. even that little bit. So I am so grateful to have been around at the time when we, we would get a script and it would be 120 pages. And on page nine, it would go sex scene. So we made real movies with sex dispersed within it. Mm-hmm. And they were fabulous. The mm-hmm. lighting sucked and it was very hairy time, but you know, <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I actually found uh, this one scene that you shot for my mom. I can't remember the name of the movie, but do you remember she played the host and it was a game show of yes. some kind? Doctor, uh, uh, no. And uh, it was like a like a space age yes. kind of thing? I know exactly the one. And Tracy her, Lord is in it. Yeah, and her dildo's a microphone. Yes. Oh my God, <laughs> what is that movie called? That was hysterical. I can't remember either. I should oh, know this. Oh no. Yeah, that was, that was a fun movie to do. We had like fuck offs and your mom was the judge. Yes. I remember shooting with your mom on another film. I, I can't remember which film it was, but... Your mom was always running around and doing all that she had to do. And she was running up the stairs as I was coming down. She was on her way to do something really quickly. Mm -hmm. And she fell and tweaked her knee and screamed and cried. And I'm like, fuck, you know what I do? I'm trying to help her. And she sucked her shit up and pulled it together and shot that. I don't know how she, she couldn't stand on that leg. And yet she shot the entire fucking movie. Yeah. Yeah. She's just. I've I've gotten that from her. Like nothing will stop me. Like I have to be I never cancel shoots. I have to be literally like in the hospital for me to cancel a shoot. Like I've fallen, I've hurt myself on set and I just pick myself. I've just had just that drive. It. Yeah. Yeah. And absolutely. that's a great quality that you that you inherited or were taught by your mother. Yeah. I but it, the reason I brought up that movie was cuz I remember my mom had this ridiculous Miss hairstyle. Passion. Oh, okay, that's what it was. Miss Passion. She had a ridiculous hairstyle for that. Like she shaved like the sides of her head and put like <laughs> color in Colors it. Colors in it. And I remember she picked me up from school with that <laughs> hairstyle and I was like, Mom, what the <laughs> fuck did you do to your hair? And she's like, Oh, nothing, not. And I remember that so distinctly because I remember being so confused about like why my mom's hair was so weird. <laughs> and then I see the movie and I'm like, Oh, oh now I get it. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of Tracy Lords, we're going to take another quick commercial break and then we're going to come back we're going to talk can about i say tracy one Lords. word about tracy before we take the break yes Cut. all right come back to hear more <laughs> <laughs> let's face it we live in an entirely different world these days and sometimes it's really hard to meet new people say hello to mygirlfund.com my girl fund allows you to form virtual relationships with sexy fun women on mygirlfund.com you can virtually meet message, exchange photos and videos with girls in complete privacy. My Girl Fund was launched in 2009, and over the years, they formed a community of amazing, fun, sexy women who want to meet you. My Girl Fund is completely discreet, and the girls on the website control their own exposure. These are not porn stars. These are regular girls who are looking to meet new people online and also maybe help get their college fund paid for You can join mygirlfund.com for free and for a limited time, get a lifetime membership for under $5 by visiting mygirlfund.com slash holly. Meet sexy, independent women and form intimate virtual relationships with them at mygirlfund.com slash holly. All right. So we're back and I'm going to ask you about one of the biggest scandals that rocked the adult industry. One that I just remember distinctly because my parents actually sat me down and told me that mommy and daddy might go to jail. And they tried to explain to me what to do if the cops came and dragged them out of the house in the middle of the night because that's what they were expecting. Right. And that was... As we all were. Yeah. And that was the Tracy Lord scandal. So Tracy Lords was a very popular porn star who turned out to be underage. Allegedly. Do we really know that she was underage? I thought you were going to say, do we really know that she was popular? No, she was very popular. So, yeah, tell us us your experience with that whole thing. You know, I met Tracy outside of Jim South's office, Mm -hmm. our agent, and there was a grocery store. And a lot of times before you would go to the set, you would meet in the parking lot of this Mm -hmm. grocery store. And that's where I met Tracy. And I remember she had those 
big curlers in her hair and the little dolphin shorts that we all wore back then. And I thought, wow, this is a, a, a woman. I mean, she was just so voluptuous mm-hmm. and so confident. And I've never, I'm, I've never been like, I'm not, not confident, but I have a really shy side. Yeah. I, I, I have that, uh, Perfect. Let, let's say if I had to give Tracy an animal that she was, Tracy would be a, 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 a an alligator. You okay. Know? An alligator, maybe a shark. Okay. I'm the puppy in the corner that's running around excited, peeing on the floor. Okay. Okay. So so the, the difference in our personality, she was just so bold and outgoing and, mm-hmm. and mature and, and foul mouth. She, I, I swear. And she had a mouth like a fucking truck driver. So I ha- instantly had this fear of her and this admiration at the same time. Mm. You know, it was like, I want to be like this girl, um, but I'm afraid of this girl. Mm-hmm. And so we ended up doing five or six movies together. And I hated the cunt. Just a horrible, nasty, two-faced, lying piece of shit. There's not a thing I can say nice about her. I hope her tits rot and fall off. Tell us how you really feel, Ginger, um, because I'm not sure. <laughs> am, I, am I not getting it across? <laughs> no, no. You no. sound like you might like her a little bit. I don't know. Well, what... what ambivalence. I sense <laughs> some ambivalence here. Well, speaking of your mom and your dad afraid that they may go to jail, I... The first and only film that I've ever produced, I wrote it. It's called Those Young Girls. Mm-hmm. I hired a director from the improv... Uh, I had three of my friends. We invested in the movie, and we decided we were going to have Ginger Lynn, Tracy Lords, John Holmes, and Harry Reams, the four biggest names that were around at the time. Mm-hmm. And so that's who I cast without anyone knowing that I was one of the producers. Right. Because I wanted to make money off this little cunt. And I was like, all right, I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> and so I, I, when I wrote it, I, I had no fucking idea she was if she was underage. Mm-hmm. So I wrote a scene where we're 13 in a tent exploring, you know, and, you know, a, a year later I'm, I'm, you know, in trouble for making this movie. Uh, one of my partners was arrested. The other one, they did raid his home and he ended up uh, having to go to a, a, a mental facility for a while just to, to get his head straight because wow. he had shot Tracy so much. Yeah. Um, but, when Tracy came out with, with being underage or, you know, I, I was called before the U.S. attorney to speak before a grand jury. And I refused. And they told me if I didn't go, they would make my life very difficult. So I went before the grand jury and they showed me photographs that were taken from behind trees, from in a bush, from over here. I, I saw photographs of Tracy and directors and producers and myself taken by people from hidden areas. So whether she turned herself in, whether she really was underage, they fucking knew that she was making porn before anybody did anything. I've seen the photos. Um, I just, I have nothing nice to say about it. She ruined so many people's lives. I ended up, uh, they wanted, when I didn't help the grand jury, I have a really bad memory, and my grandfather taught me you never snitch, you never steal, you never lie. Mm-hmm. You know, those are just, you just don't. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I didn't snitch. I didn't remember anybody's name. And you don't know people's names. You know, they're Bubba or they're whoever mm-hmm. they are. You know, yeah. Ernie is probably somebody else, too. <laughs> you know, uh, everybody's got a different name. Right. So, uh, five years to the day after. The grand jury appearance, I'm at, I'm dating Charlie Sheen at the time. I'm at Charlie's house and my attorney calls me. We're, we're on shrooms. We're like tripping out and making fun of Mary Steenburgen's name because we were so high. <laughs> Mary Steenburgen, Mary Steenburgen. <laughs> and we were ta- I, I remember because we were taking photos and we were wearing shades and we were just being really goofy and having mm-hmm. a good time. And my attorney calls and says, you've been indicted. And I'm like, for what? And they paid someone for five fucking years to watch every movie that I ever made, read every interview that I ever did, follow every move that I made. They tried to charge me with tax evasion. And at that point in time, it was not mandatory that employers 
1099 their employees. Right. So I had $2,087.04 in my checking account that I didn't have a 1099 to go with. And so what they charged me with was willfully subscribing to a false tax return. They claimed what they tried to get people to say was that they had paid me in cash too. So they were saying that, you know, I had made all this money in cash and they just couldn't find it. So I knew that I'd made more and $2,087 and four fucking cents. It was just because I didn't help. And so what happened, we're getting back around to Tracy here, is that I was, I got 750 hours of community service and three years of probation, which included mandatory drug testing. So I had a number I had to call every night and see if I had to go in and test the next day. So I do my 750 hours of community service. I am such a geek. I knit. And so I would tour and strip. And in between my shows, I'm in the back knitting. I did all these blankets for people in wheelchairs. So I did over 100 of them for my kids. That's how, that's how I did my community service. Oh, my gosh. And two weeks before I'm off probation, uh, I had been given permission to fly to Cannes for the film festival. Mm-hmm. I'm in Cannes. I'm on the beach doing a press, a press junket, and I look down the beach, and somebody has a bigger one. I'm like, who the fuck is down there? So I finish mine, and I go down to the other one. It's like, who, who's got more people <laughs> than got- me? <laughs> and it's Charlie. Uh-huh. And we had broken up. There was we, we were together steady for two years and then had three years of off and on. Mm-hmm. So this was during our off period, and he's like, come, come with me to Vienna. And I don't have permission to go to Vienna. And I'm like, all right, let's go to Vienna. So I fly to Vienna, and we were not very quiet about our goings out. I was actually engaged temporarily to someone else at the time. Mm -hmm. So I'm wearing a ring. So the press picks up. Charlie and I are in Vienna. I'm wearing a ring. It's on the news. My probation officer sees it. When I get back that first time I call, I'm going in for a drug test. I've been in Vienna for two weeks with the entire cast of of uh, the Three Musketeers and Charlie Sheen and Charlie Sheen. <laughs> I am not going to pass my fucking drug test. <laughs> There's no way. Yeah. Do not collect two hundred dollars. Go straight to jail. So uh, I test dirty, yeah. and I'm supposed to. I've got a noon turn in time, and so my father, and my grandfather drive out from Illinois, and they're they're at my house. Um, I'm still in bed. They go to my bank to clear out my my money and all my possessions and my safe deposit boxes because I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. So uh, the marshals, I get a phone call and and uh, they hang up. Five minutes later, the marshals are at my door, and I'm not letting them in. My, yeah. It's me and my grandma in there, and. I know, but the thing is, I'm supposed to turn myself in, and they they came at like 10 in the morning, two hours before, just to humiliate me. Mm. And so eventually, they did get the the hinges, the door off the hinges. Oh, my God. (laughs) Well, I'm literally tearing bed sheets. I'm on the third floor. My condo's on the third floor, (laughs) and I'm trying to, like, make an escape. (laughs) <laughs> so, oh my god uh, but my dad got back right as I got the door off and I was able to say goodbye to my dad mm-hmm. and I went directly to uh, the, the holding cell downtown from there I went to MDCLA which is maximum security mm-hmm. in with with uh, murderers, weapons dealers drug dealers uh, the worst of the worst I'm in yeah. with some really really bad people and uh there's there's a lot of things that happened when I was in prison. I, I'm working on a book right now, which is very close to being done. It's called I Don't Look Good on Paper. <laughs> Let's see. Ex-porn star. She was uh, an abused child. She's a convicted felon. She's a single parent. She likes sex with just about anybody. You know, on paper, it yeah. just doesn't look it. Yeah. But I'm a really nice person. I just like to fuck. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I violate and uh, I've got, I'm in MDCLA. The night that they've taken me in, I've been in a holding tank all day, and it's like 2 in the morning now. I've mm-hmm. been strip-searched, humiliated, embarrassed. I'm put into a cell by myself. Uh, I climb up onto the top bunk, and I'm just – they've had me a, a stack of – there's a pair of uh, pants, a T-shirt, and underwear, and the underwear is stained with someone else's period blood. And, oh. you know, it's just – and I'm sitting there not believing – I, I don't have fucking parking tickets. I don't, if I do things, I don't get caught. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't do anything this time except for violate probation. So yeah. I did do it. I did do it. But uh, the the two guards came into my cell that night and started talking about the way that I suck cock and what a great 
cocksucker I am, and they love the. And I'm going, fuck! I've made this movie. I'm gonna get. And I, and I freak the fuck out. I'm screaming. I'm throwing oh a tantrum, God. and I'm up on the top bunk, and they're just in the cell, and they start laughing and they leave. Mm-hmm. They don't do anything to me. But what happens is every day you are allowed two five minute phone calls. Yeah, you know, and you got to fight for your spot because anybody bigger is going to kick you out of the line. So it's right. it's like a, you got to. The moment you get to federal prison, you need to assume that fucking position. And and thank God that I had some acting abilities right. because you, you you don't walk in there and be a little miss. You know, I'm nice to everybody. Yeah, you, you you change. You just have to. Yeah. Um. So I called my attorney, and every phone call that goes out of the prison is recorded. And my right. attorney said, "Well, I'll be contacting the Wall Street Journal. I'm going to contact the press. Everybody's going to know what happened." And miraculously, the next day, I got to go before the judge. Hmm. Uh, so I was facing six years for the violation. Wow. And I went before the judge. All really basically around a $2,000 unaccounted for like 1099. No, it's basically because the cunt Tracy Lords gave them. She, I, I read the, the document that she gave them. There was a piece of paper and it was written out. Tracy had, it was her, her statement about the industry and who would be able to help turn people in. The people that knew everything. There was me, there was Tom Byron, and there was Harry Reams on that piece of paper. Wow. I was the first one they went after. And since it took so long and nothing came of it. They didn't go after Tom and Harry, but Tracy started this whole fucking thing. It never would have happened in the first place if it weren't for her. The drug violation, all on me. I did that. I take full responsibility, Right. but it never should have happened in the first place. Right. I never should have learned how to mix and fix heroin so I could shoot up my celly, so the junkie, so that I didn't go to the hole. I never should have learned how to make a shiv. I never should have learned how to how to take light bulbs out of a ceiling, use a pencil and, and a, a, a pair of tweezers or a clippers and make a, a match to light my cigarettes so I can smoke in my cell. I watched a girl get sodomized and her eye poked out. Federal prison is no fucking joke. So do I, am I mad at Tracy Lords? Do I have a problem with the cunt? Yes, I do. I do. And, uh, they'll, you know, a lot of the stories will be told when, when my book comes out. But uh, the judge ordered that I do uh, 30 days in a rehab and then 90 days in um, uh, Gateway CCC. And Gateway CCC is an echo park. They call them cottages. And basically, they're these little houses on this gated, you know, prison razor wire community. And there were seven women, four in my house, three in another, and over 80 men. And these are the people that have gotten out of prison after doing long, hard time and are trying to transition back into society. So it's kind of like a halfway house. Yeah. But I'm in with, with Essie the arsonist. Margaret, the murderer, who's proud that she she just did seven years for killing her husband. She's getting out, and she's all happy. Uh, and then I can't remember the other girls because she was kind of boring. She just did credit card theft. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I got a murder, a murderer and an arsonist to focus on right Jesus. now. So, uh, so I ended up 30 days of rehab, but the full amount of time in prison was three months and 17 days with another 30 tacked on in, in rehab. Wow. And uh, So you did three— so I did three months and 17 days federal. Right. And uh, 30 days in a rehab. Wow. And, you know, it may not sound like a lot of time, but just the way that things happen there and the way that things are and the way that you are so isolated from society and from your friends and from the people that you know. Yeah. Uh, it made me stop wearing come fuck me shoes and start wearing fuck you boots. Mm. You know, it, it, it gave me a hardness that I don't like in myself. Mm-hmm. It gave me an edge. It made me see the ugly in people. And I choose, yeah. I choose to see the beauty in people. Right. So it, it's an experience that I wish never happened, but I appreciate what I've learned from it. Right. You know, and I'm, I'm four years plus sober coming up on five. So, you know, my, my, my drug use is, uh, is, has, has changed over the years. I don't do <laughs> drugs anymore. Yeah. Uh, you know, and don't drink or, but you know, so. Wow. That's, that's the Tracy. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I've got more on the Tracy Lords. You want um, one more little story? Sure. All right. So I'm, I am in gateway CCC. Mm-hmm. I am allowed to leave for work. I have an audition. I get to Warner Brothers Studios. I get on the lot. 
I walk into the casting room. Tracy fucking Lords is there in the casting room for this new series that's coming out. And I'm fuck. I'm going back to prison and going to pee in a cup in about an hour. Yeah. Okay. And she's in there and I, I grab the script and I walk outside and I'm reading it. And it turns out the show is NYPD blue. Dennis Franz is who I have all my scenes with. And there's one line in the script that says, I want to lick your lollipop. And I, slammed the script down. I, I said, I'm not doing this role. I called my agent. I go, I am not saying that line. I'm not doing it. I didn't give a fuck about the line. I'll take any acting job you give me. <laughs> <laughs> I love to be in front of the camera. But I, I was so distraught, so upset. And this is, it kind of goes back to the Jerry Butler story um, as getting riled up and not caring. Mm-hmm. I walked in, there's a dozen people, Stephen Botchko sitting there. And I did the audition cold, threw it off got the role. They wow. put me on hold right then. So I went back to prison as Tracy went back home and I got the role on NYPD Blue, which was nominated for five Emmys and won three and I was the guest star. <gasps> Congratulations. Yes. Is that me, Dean? I think that's me. Oh, okay. Is that, can you look? Oh, wait, no, it's right here. It is me. You know what's hilarious is it's, it's, <laughs> so I'm a director. As, right. And I always yell at people to turn off their cell phones. Guess who always leaves their cell phone on? Yeah. Me. You. Every fucking time. To the point where my crew just like laughs about it. Cause I'm like, is everyone's cell phones off? They're like, is your cell phone off, Holly? <laughs> and every fucking time it's me. Are you directing porn? Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Girl, you can't make a living taking pictures anymore. Oh, I didn't know you were directing porn. I yeah. love that you're a porn director. Yeah. I love it. Do you come across these girls sometimes that you think should go home? Um, or do you cast a little bit more carefully? Uh, it depends on who, it depends on who I'm working for. So certain clients, uh, they pick the talent. Um, other clients, like Wicked lets me choose whoever I want. So I'm very picky about like who I pick because I only want to work with girls that can do dialogue that I like, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's definitely been occasionally I come across girls that I'm like, "Mm, this might be, may not be right for you. But honestly, for the most part, Everybody that I've worked with is awesome. Like, I, I think the industry's really changed a lot. And like I said, like the power and control that women have over their own careers now, I think has shifted. There's been a lot of shifts. It's, it, it, it's time. And yeah. I love that you're a female director. It makes such a big difference. And, Thank and you. It, you give me, you know, I, I know that I, I, I'm not saying anything bad about porn. I, mm. I loved it when I was in it, but I'm scared for the girls today just because of, you know, how it can fuck with your head. Mm-hmm. And, there's a big difference working with a female director. Mm. Uh, the girls, it's just, there's a comfort level. There's there's more of an honesty and a realism that comes out when you've got a female director. And I know that you're a good person, so I know that these girls are being taken care of. Yeah. So congratulations and thank, thank you. you for uh, being such a good influence on the women thank in you. the industry today. I mean that. Thank you. I do my best. And you know, honestly, like people have real, there's been, I think especially with the Me Too movement, there's been a real shift in the way that, People treat talent these days, just in general, like even the companies now, like, oh, re- oh I mean, there's now people are, cause there's been these stories where, you know, girls come out and talk about how they were, um, kind of uh, forced is not the right word, but like coerced and doing things they weren't comfortable with. Mm-hmm. They felt, com- they felt uncomfortable. They felt like they couldn't call cut. They felt like they couldn't like say, bas- no. say no. And that's shifted a lot because now that girls have come out, because of social media and been able to say like, Hey, I was put in this position where I was made to do something that I didn't want to do. And I never felt like I had the power to say no. And so I think companies are becoming a lot more aware of that. Oh, that's, and makes me so grateful. Yeah. And, 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 you know, especially in the people that I work for, I'm very particular about who I work for. Twisties is my main client okay, and they're them. really good yeah. about the way that they treat talent. Like if I call they them good girls. Yeah. yeah. If, and honestly, Twisties is mostly run by women now. I love that. So love that. maybe uh, that's the big change that needs to come. There's a lot the more, a lot more women behind the scenes. And if I call them and I say, "Hey, this girl's uncomfortable," even if she doesn't like her hairstyle, they're like, "Change it. We want her to feel comfortable. We want her to feel good. Like she doesn't that's want to do this thing. School. Change it. Like so it's you know what I mean? Back. Yeah. Because I think they recognize it's not worth it to make somebody do something they're uncomfortable with. Like for what? For a fucking scene? Yeah. Like why? Yeah. And the girls, I, I, I. My advice to the ones who do get in it, learn to say no. Set your boundaries. Yes. So important. And people really, yes. 
you know, not everybody. I mean, the porn world is not perfect. There, you still got shady producers, agents, all that stuff. But a lot of people um, are will respect your boundaries. I love and if they don't, okay. fucking walk off set. Yeah, that's Fuck what them. I mean. That's what I would do. That's yeah. you know the position that I would take. Yeah. So I'm I'm so glad. I didn't know you were directing. I'm so proud yeah, of you. I'm so happy you. to hear that. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, okay, so can I ask you about Charlie Sheen? Who? <laughs> so it's so funny because you know there's been a lot of you know Charlie's Angels when he was dating uh, Brie Olson and uh, like Celeste and Jana and I think there was some other girl. and then so he was engaged many. to Brett Rossi like he you know before all that publicity was around him with those girls you were the first <laughs> Like porn girl, basically, with Charlie. And I think you were like one of his... You guys were together for a long time. We were together steady for two years and then off again, on again for another three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I met Charlie. I was working... Uh, I've been very fortunate to have a, a, a decent mainstream career. I've mm-hmm. now done more mainstream movies than I have porn. Wow. And uh, yeah... I, it's pretty exciting. So I was on the set of Young Guns too. I'd been cast in it. Oh, I loved that movie. Yeah, no, you missed all my good stuff. They had a four-hour finished I cut, love... and they cut all the girls out. I have a scene oh, where uh, a... Young Guns. Who else was in it? Well, Kiefer what's his Sutherland. Name? What's his uh, name? Blue Lou, Lou, Lou Phillips? Diamond Phillips. Lou Diamond Phillips. That's who. So it was. I fucked Lou Diamond Phillips. <laughs> um, who else did I fuck on that set? Uh, Christian Slater. Oh my god! I was obsessed with Christian Slater when I was. Oh, I a tied kid. him to the bed with my belt. <sighs> and just took advantage of him. Uh, uh, and then I lives almost, you have lived, Ginger. I almost fucked William Peterson. He left his number at the front desk for me. <laughs> but that was the night that Charlie came in, and so now I'm, I'm I, you know, making my way through the crew or the cast. <laughs> Um, I'm making my way through, and Charlie, Charlie, I'd heard for a while that Charlie wanted to meet me, mm-hmm. and. I knew that he, I didn't want to be a star fucker. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, there's certain things that just make me go, "Eh." Yeah. you know, I'll tell you about it after I did it, but it's not my goal to go out and fuck stars. Yeah. Like if you meet someone and you like them, then you'll have sex with them, but you don't purposely go out to have sex with celebrities just because they're a celebrity. No, although he was so good looking that uh, at that time that mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so I we meet and what we would do after filming every day, we were shooting in uh, in Arizona, is meet in the lobby of this big wonderful hotel that we were staying at. We would have drinks and everybody would just meet and sit there and mingle and and talk and hang out. And then after that, later in the night, we would all go to the strip club like mm. every night. Oh wow! So Charlie comes in that first day and uh, I'm in my room. And I'd been to the strip club the night before. I'm in the bathroom, the hurling in the toilet. And I hear Charlie's voice go, is Ginger Lynn here? The the entrance to my my, my uh, hotel, it was, they were like cottages. The entrance to my cottage had the bathroom right next to the, the door. Right. So I'm in there. <laughs> <laughs> Are you hung and, over? Oh, my God. I'm hung over. <laughs> I'm hurling all over the place. I'm sicker than a dog. I've got diarrhea. And Charlie's at the door, and I'm trying to be quiet. <laughs> and, and there's, like, nothing I can do. So uh, thank God my friend Alexis, uh, she was working on the film with me, and, and we shared a room. Uh, she said, you know, Ginger's not here right now. And Charlie didn't ask. So I met him later after filming. Um, in the lobby of the hotel, and I remember I sat on the sofa, and he sat on the arm of the sofa, and he brought me my drinks, and we started talking and getting to know each other, and uh, we went to a strip club, and I bought him two girls Mm -hmm. that I picked out for him to dance Mm -hmm. for him, and he said if he had chosen, those are the girls that he would have chosen, and so we're, you know, we've got Kiefer's up on the stage. The strippers are all over him. I've got Charlie over in the corner with all the best looking strippers. Everybody's at Lou Diamond. Like everybody is partying. Bothell's our Getty's there. He's like 16 and he's in the strip club. Um, <laughs> it was just, it was a big party. Yeah. Um, and so, and it was Valentine's Day. And I remember very clearly because after we left the strip club, I went back and went to Charlie's room. Mm-hmm. And we were in the bed. We hadn't done anything yet, but he took off his engagement ring mm-hmm. and the phone rang and he said, I have to take this. And this was before cell phone. So it was his right. phone in his room was ringing and he was engaged to Kelly Preston at the time. So it was Kelly calling. I didn't even know that 
they were engaged. Yes. Yes. Wow. And, and he had just shot her. It was it was an accident. Mm-hmm. The gun fell and uh, Oh wait. Oh, oh he'd shot her with a gun. With yeah. Oh. <laughs> Like you shot her in a movie. I was no. like, what? Was he directing now? Or something? No, with a gun. Oh, boy. That's a whole other story. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. But I remember him saying, you know, happy Valentine's Day. I love you. And and I'm laying there next to him and just waiting for him to get off the phone to fuck his brains out. Yeah. And so we had that night together. He stayed for another four or five days. Um, I came back to Los Angeles and the boyfriend that I was with uh, what I left out of the story was maybe a month or so before he decided to look at my, one of my porn movies and he had never seen one and a porn period, one of my porns. Oh, okay. I was going to say my porns. And so I can't went from being, I don't tell me it was the Ron Jeremy one. No, I don't No, He didn't tell me which one he watched, <laughs> but no, all of a sudden I was a cocksucker. I was a whore. I had my foot on both sides of the fence. Wow. And I, the, the, the nicest guy in the world has now got me on the floor in the corner, like crying the night before I'm leaving to do young guns too. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, I told him, I, I said, I'm done. Mm-hmm. So I flew off and I was fully ready to fuck every single person on the cast and crew. Right. Uh, so I uh, got back and moved out of my house and moved into a hotel. And uh, Charlie and I just hung out nonstop. And I remember there was one of his friends was getting married and his makeup artist. And he wanted me to arrange for the girls for the party. So I had just danced up in San Francisco and San Francisco girls are down for anything. They're awesome. They're mm-hmm. just wild, fun girls. Yeah. So I called, you know, the people that I knew and Charlie arranged for a private jet and we had all the girls fly in and we flew everybody to Las Vegas and, uh, and we had this big party and I brought these giant tarps and gallons of baby oil and dildos for everybody. And, oh, you know, just brought dildos them. for everybody, yeah, dildos for everybody. <laughs> you know, I, I took on the set decorating and the prop master. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> and so everybody's like getting excited and turned on and the girls are all there and everybody's drinking, everybody's partying. And Charlie pulls me aside and he said, are you going to get out there and, and join the girls. And they said, no, I wasn't planning on it. And he goes, good, because I really dig you. And that was, I, I really dig you was was the term. And uh, he broke up with, with Kelly on St. Patrick's Day. Wow. So that was February to March. So within a month of us meeting, he broke his engagement off. Right. And then we were just on. We were inseparable for, for two years. We, we fucked like bunnies. Charlie, I, I, as far as like a performer, oh my God. Like we would fuck six times a day, easy. No problem every fucking day. Wow. He would have been like the strongest performer ever in his heyday, mm-hmm. in his heyday. And, you know, I I don't want to say that we would still be together if this didn't happen, but we had gotten so close that Charlie's agents, Charlie's managers, Charlie's family, mm-hmm. people were telling him, she's going to hold you back. She's going to ruin your career. You've got to, you've got to do this. And Charlie and I went around and around and around and even got to the point where Charlie had made arrangements, if I was willing to do it, to have reconstructive surgery on my face and to plan my own death. He had that, that was our plan so that we could be together. I was going to go to Europe for a couple of years, get an accent so that we could, and he would come and see me all the time. I mean, that's how serious we were. And that's how fucked up the, the powers that, that were in. Wait, you were going to fake your own death and come back as a different person? I, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And the only reason I didn't was because of my grandmother and my dad. I just, I just couldn't do it to my family. Yeah. Um, but I, it, it was, I That's a lot to ask. I was so in love. Yeah. I was so in love. I, I, I was this close to doing it. I wow. was this close. And when you're that in love and, and both of you are, and you've got people tearing you apart and pulling at you, it was just, that's why the last three years were so difficult because it was, we had to sneak. We had, you know, like, I mean, the moment we saw each other in Cannes, it was just like two people in the commercial running along the beach. Yeah. Slow you know? motion yeah, to each other. Yeah. It was, yeah. And it was my first love. My, the first time I was ever in love with anybody um that's really heartbreaking and 
you know, just, I mean, we talked earlier about the stigma of porn following you yeah, and yeah. you know how I feel like that's the stigma itself is, I feel like the most damaging thing about porn. And I mean, there's, you got, it depends on how you deal with it though. You know what? I get recognized a lot and I don't care. I like it. I enjoy it. I think, right. I thank my fans and I think what happens is you attract the type of fans that are attracted to the type of person you are. Mm-hmm. And I am the girl next door. I'm bubbly, I'm energetic, I'm fun, I love the fuck. And so my fans are primarily just really nice guys. Right. <laughs> but it's not even necessarily the fans. It's just like the mainstream media. I mean, the way yeah. that they destroyed your relationship with Charlie. I yeah, mean, no, you couldn't be with the man did. that you loved yeah. because of what you did for a living. Exactly. That's terrible. It, but you know, if you look at, I look, in hindsight now, I mean, where Charlie has gone with his life, yeah. um, you know, I'm the one that probably would have gotten the most damage had I stayed with him anyway, yeah. you know, because I've, I'll say it, I've got my head on my shoulders a little bit more than Charlie does. Do you feel like maybe if you guys had stayed together, maybe he wouldn't have gone down the path that he went down or? I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, and, and when I was able to calm him mm-hmm. and keep it like if he if he did too many drugs or did too much of this or too much of that, um, I was just really good with him. I was able to to bring him back to a good place, and I think that he just began to go so far down down that rabbit hole that he needed new things to to, to get him off. You know, mm-hmm. if, if there was ever a person who I, Charlie is the most intelligent. He he is he's like a genius. Mm-hmm. I mean, he literally is. He's brilliant, um, and it, it, it. I don't know if it would if he would have gone down and still continued on that hole because I would have left. You know. Yeah. And you know, I stopped doing drugs. You know, decades ago. You yeah. Know, and and you know, it's just not my lifestyle. So I think that. He, he it would have happened to him anyway. He right. just has a huge hole to fill. Yeah, and uh, and now I don't know what he's filling it with. He's not working, that as far as I know. And yeah, yeah. No, I feel horror. I feel so bad for him. It broke my heart when I heard that he had H- that he was HIV positive. Right. Yeah. You guys don't talk anymore, do you? No, no. And it's it, that's really the, one of the saddest parts about it is mm. uh, in 1996 I was still seeing Charlie. We were, you know off and on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I got pregnant and Charlie wanted me to go public that it wasn't his child. And I'm like, I don't know if this is your baby or not. I'm not going public with fuck all. Yeah. You know, I'm not doing anything. And so I did end up getting the test done and it wasn't Charlie's baby, but because I wouldn't, he had his attorney call me and -hmm. tell me I needed to make a statement. And I'm like, if Charlie has something to say to me, have him say it or I'll do whatever the fuck I want. Yeah. And uh, so that was kind of the the end of, of our friendship. But I, I, I don't have anything negative to say about him. Mm-hmm. You know, he's he's a good man that just, he's got some demons. Yeah. 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 We all do. He just got his bigger part of the share. Yeah. I mean, you know, you and I have both been, you know, through it with addiction and stuff like that. And, you know, I'm in recovery and, I'll have two years in July, God willing. Congratulations. And July what? Thank you. July 6th. Mine's July 3rd. Oh, really? Yeah. I'll oh, be, my God. I'll be five. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I uh, had a terrible, uh, ju- the 4th of July, I had a terrible um, relapse where um, my hu- my husband, um, he found, he had to break down the door and pull me out of the bathtub, pass out in the bathtub. And then uh, they were going to send me to a rehab or the next day um, or sober living. And while my, <laughs> while my parents were on the phone trying to get it all arranged, I snuck down into the kitchen and stole like a bunch of beer and drank a bunch of like warm beer at like 7 a.m. up in the bathroom. So my first You're day You're good of at it. Sobriety, good for you. I'm really sneaky. Um, was July 6th. It was but, July 6th. But anyways, what I was going to say is that you know, addiction is such a demon and it's just, when it gets claws in you, it's so hard. And I have always 
really felt for celebrities that deal with that because I can't imagine what it's like to be in a place where, first of all, usually you're surrounded by yes men, Mm -hmm. people who won't deny you anything, people who want something from you, people who will give you, you're used to getting whatever you want. And then like trying to go through recovery, you know, like I go to meetings, like I've seen celebrities at meetings and the way that other people look at you and, and, you know, media parked outside of meetings. I I remember when Lindsay Lohan was trying to go to meetings. It People would so the media would come outside of a meeting that I went to and take pictures of her when she came out. It was just like you can't you know, it's just like everybody's watching you. You're under this fucking microscope. It's just like I oh it just there, breaks there my are heart. Ways around it because Charlie and I uh we partied hard for the first six months of our relationship mm-hmm. and uh some things happened and gotta read the book. Yes. Uh and we decided to get sober. Mm -hmm. And so we were sober together for 13 months and uh, Charlie's people arranged for meetings with other celebrities. Yeah. So we would go to people's houses and to private meetings. Yeah. Um, So, you know, that's what, which makes it really hard because when you're new, you just need to go in and and disappear. You don't want anybody to see you there. Right, exactly. You know, you're just like sitting in the room going, do I belong here? And these people are more fucked up than I am. And, Mm -hmm. you know, all the things that cross your mind. Mm -hmm. I've battled with addiction since, if I'm honest, since I was 13. Yeah. You know, and it's just, it's that combined with mental illness Mm -hmm. is a really, really bad combo. So, you know, the the fact that I I stopped self-medicating with drugs years ago is huge for me. Right. You know, and then I stopped alcohol five years ago, but I have to always be in contact with my sponsor. You know, I have mm-hmm. to stay close yeah. because it's really easy for me to romanticize. Mm-hmm. Um, I was at your parents' house and your mom and dad were drinking wine the other night and, yeah. and your mom goes, you don't drink any alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> no, being an alcoholic means I don't drink Now I can't have a glass. I feel like I would have taught her that by now. My parents have spent a lot of money studying me to rehab. It's like, come on, mom. You've been through this. Well, I guess because I'm not so crazy and wild as I used to be when I would come over to your house or Mm -hmm. your mom's house. Yeah. uh, That she was like, all right, come on, let's get ginger crazy. I'm like, no, I'm good. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations on your sobriety. Thank you. It's a really tough, uh, disease to deal with mm-hmm. and it, it never goes away so if you ever want to talk thank you you got my number let's stay close thank you yeah oh my gosh this has been amazing i feel like we could go on forever why don't we do a, a part two another time i'm yeah. back in town once a month okay oh so, fantastic um i can come back on and we can do it again well we're also going to if you have 10 minutes we're going to do a little quick uh, bonus video right i look at the camera <laughs> Bonus video from a Patreon members. I have a bunch of questions that they sent me. Okay. So yeah. um, we're going to do that for you guys. So if you're a member of my Patreon, then you can uh, check out these bonus questions. I'm going to ask you about Mark Hamill. And I'm going to ask you about New Wave Hookers and a couple of other special ginger stories. Uh-oh. <laughs> so before we go, though, I want to quickly touch on you're doing art now. I've been painting for about 20 years. Yeah. I, when I stopped making porn, I, I've always been creative. So I started designing jewelry and mm-hmm. I sold it uh, on commission. And about, you know, about 20 years ago, I, I was trying to keep my son occupied and interested mm-hmm. in doing things, get being creative. And so I bought a few canvases and I bought some, some paint and I started painting with my two year old and I've sold over a hundred paintings at this point. My website is gingerlinart.com. Uh, I'm always doing something new. I'm inspired by so many things. A lot of, uh, I do a lot of nudes and women mm-hmm. and a lot of them are based on photographs that your mother took of me. Oh really? Yes. Oh my God. That's so yes. cool. <laughs> that's fantastic. So that's, I, I've been doing that for quite some time now and I do, always, I've got gingerlin.com, which is where you can go to find out everything. Mm-hmm. That's your big like that's, hub that's of the all hub. the gingerlin things. Yes. And then there's gingerlin auctions as well. Okay. So, and then on social media, where can people find you? You can find me. I am on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and my, I call it my handle because I'm old, is uh, <laughs> Blame It On Ginger. 
Fantastic. So if it's any but any other name, like I'm the real Ginger Lynn or whatever, it's not. Blame it on Ginger is from my radio days when anybody did anything, they would always just blame it on me. So if you ever get in trouble, just blame it on me. You might as well. Everybody else does. <laughs> so you can find me at Blame It on Ginger. Fantastic. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. I've got a Facebook group, facebook.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered, and also youtube.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered if you're listening to this on the audio platforms. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and we'll see you next week. 